Tim Duncan is a Hall of Famer, owner of five NBA rings with the Spurs, and arguably the worst dresser the NBA has ever seen. When he nearly had a quadruple double in a game, his response was, that's cool. Duncan was the most quiet, unassuming, and yet one of the best players to ever play. We'll discuss was he really that successful because of the Spurs, or were the Spurs that good because of him? From swimming to basketball, Tim Duncan was born in 1976 in the U.S. Virgin Islands. He was the youngest of four siblings and dreamed of becoming a professional swimmer like his older sister. Tim was extremely talented, and the grand plan was to compete at the freestyle events in the 92 Olympics in Barcelona. However, after a hurricane destroyed the only Olympic-sized pool on the island, Tim had to make other plans. Because of his fear of sharks, he didn't want to train in the ocean and decided to pick up basketball at the age of 14. Duncan was awkward and raw at first, but he was also a quick learner, and after a 10-inch growth spurt, he soon became the best player in the Virgin Islands. Duncan averaged 25 points, 12 rebounds, and 5 blocks per game as a senior, after which he accepted a scholarship offer to attend Wake Forest University. Four years at Wake Forest, after a promise to his mother. Duncan wasn't even supposed to be playing in his freshman year at Wake Forest, but after a fellow big man, Mokhtar Ndiaye, violated NCAA rules and eventually transferred to Michigan, Duncan was appointed as a starting center. Offensively, Timmy was still a bit limited at the time, and he averaged just 9.6 points per game. But at the defensive end, he was arguably the best defender in the country already as a freshman, with 9.6 rebounds and 3.8 blocked shots per game. Because he was extremely disciplined, coachable, and curious about the game, Duncan was soaking in basketball knowledge like a sponge. As a sophomore, Timmy was already among the best players in college basketball. He could have easily been a top draft pick as a sophomore or a junior, but because of a promise to his late mother, Duncan decided to stay four years in college. Tim's mother passed away from breast cancer just one day before his 14th birthday. On her deathbed, he promised her he would finish college and get a degree. In his four years at Wake Forest, Duncan averaged 16.5 points, 12.3 rebounds, and an incredible 3.8 blocks per game. Timmy was a two-time ACC Player of the Year and a three-time All-American, and a winner of back-to-back -back ACC titles with Wake in 1995 and 1996, the first the program won since the 1960s. Tim led the Deacons to the NCAA tournament every season, and as a senior in 1997, he won all National Player of the Year honors and had half the NBA dreaming of landing the first pick. The fate would have it that the Spurs won the draft lottery, and Duncan moved to San Antonio at the age of 21, which would also become his jersey number, now hanging from the rafters in the AT&T Center, dominating the league from the get-go, and four NBA titles. Four years of college had paid their dividends when Timmy got to the NBA. He was no ordinary rookie, and Charles Barkley has said it best, I have seen the future, and he wears number 21. Duncan finished his first season with 21-12 and 2.5 and blocks. He was named an All-Star, Rookie of the Year, and made the All-NBA First Team, which is a feat only he and Larry Bird accomplished in the last 50 years. The Spurs lost in the playoffs to the Jazz, who went to the finals, but they would come back with a vengeance. In a lockout-shortened season, Duncan and the Spurs secured the first seed, and they steamrolled through the playoffs. They've only lost one game before the finals, where they beat the Knicks in five games. The Spurs won their first championship in franchise history, and Duncan deservedly won the finals MVP, with 27 points, 14 rebounds, and 2.2 blocks on 54% shooting. After the series, Pop congratulated the Knicks head coach Jeff Van Gundy and told him, Hey, don't feel bad. I had Tim Duncan on my team, and you didn't. In the next three seasons, Duncan's individual numbers grew, and he won the MVP in 2002, but the Spurs couldn't get past Shaq and Kobe. Timmy repeated as the MVP in the 2003 regular season, with 23, 13, and 4, and 3 blocks. In the playoffs, they finally got past the Lakers, and then defeated the Nets 4-2 in the NBA Finals. Duncan was again the Finals MVP, and he completely dominated the series. 24.2 points, 17 rebounds, 5.3 assists, and an astonishing 5.3 blocks. The Spurs' whole philosophy was to funnel everybody into the paint, where Duncan would meet them with his perfect positioning, 7-5 wingspan, and sneaky athleticism. 2003 Duncan was the peak Duncan, and I would put this season next to some of the most dominant seasons in history, including Shaq in 2000, Jordan in 1991, and LeBron in 2013. 
In 2004, the Lakers avenged the loss and defeated the Spurs in the second round. In 2005, San Antonio was back in the finals again, this time against the Pistons, the defending champions. In a hard-fought seven-game series where the Spurs never scored 100 points, Duncan willed the Spurs to victory and was again the finals MVP with 20 points, 14 boards, and two blocks on average. In 2007, the Spurs were in the finals again against 22-year-old LeBron and the Cavs. Tim was standardly great and led the team in rebounds, assists, and blocks, but the finals MVP went to Tony Parker, who led both teams in scoring. DNP, old, and back to the finals. From 2008 to 2012, the Spurs continually made the playoffs but couldn't reach the finals in a tough Western Conference. Tim Duncan's numbers have dropped, but mostly because Popovich was saving his best player for the playoffs as a load management pioneer. One of the funniest little jokes Pop played with Timmy is when he didn't play him in a game under the explanation of old age. And that was the narrative around the franchise, that they were too old and too boring. And just when everybody thought the Spurs were finished, they proved why they were the best organization in the NBA. With the development of Kawhi Leonard, Tony Parker reaching his prime, and one of the deepest benches in the league, R.C. Buford and Pop surrounded yet another winning team around Tim Duncan, who was still the most important player on the Spurs. His athleticism and mobility were not nearly as good as before, and Duncan could barely jump off his left leg. However, he was still the big fundamental and one of the most cerebral players in the league and led the Spurs to another finals appearance. He led the team in points, rebounds, and blocks in the finals against the Heat, who nearly escaped defeat in Game 6, with LeBron's heroic performance and some help from Jesus. Not that Jesus, we mean Shuttlesworth, who hit the most important three in NBA history. Fifth title and maintaining greatness. In 2014, LeBron and the Heat dominated the East again, and the Spurs advanced in the West. Duncan was 37 years old. He was still averaging 15 and 10 on 57% shooting in the finals, where the Spurs played the most beautiful basketball of the entire Popovich era and completely dismantled the Miami Heat four games to one. Next season, at the age of 38, Timmy made all NBA third team and all defensive second team, which shows how much he was dedicated to basketball and how great he was as a player. After that, his body finally couldn't take it anymore, and we've seen father time catch up to Tim Duncan in 2016, when he played the last game of his career at the age of 40. Swimming with Coach Pop Tim Duncan's greatness is always linked to San Antonio, and vice versa. A question that's often asked, if Tim Duncan would be so good without the great Greg Popovich and the most stable organization in American sports for the last 20 years. The Spurs were the patriots of the NBA, Tim was their Tom, and Pop was their Bill. When asked what the secret of his success is, Pop will always say he was lucky that Tim Duncan fell into his lap in the second year as the Spurs coach. There is some truth in that, because the Spurs never reached the finals without Duncan. But as much as Timmy made Pop a coaching legend, Pop made Timmy a playing legend also. Duncan would have been great if he ended up anywhere, but the main man of San Antonio has allowed him to be even better than great. He pushed him to become a legend and one of the 10 best players of all time. When Pop yelled at Duncan at the practices and games, he stoically took the verbal abuse from his coach. While he was the best player in the world, the others had no choice but to follow suit. And that's why Duncan and Popovich were made for each other. Pop showed that he is special when he visited Duncan in the Virgin Islands after the draft lottery and went swimming with him in St. Croix. Pop spent four days with his number one overall pick, and the two men, with 37 years age difference, just hung out and talked, not about basketball, but about life. His unorthodox approach, in which he always took interest in who his players were as human beings, yielded two decades of success. From 1997 to 2019, San Antonio did not miss the playoffs. The Spurs won 70% of their games during the Duncan era, the best 19-year run by any NBA team in history, and the best in all four major American sports. Legacy, the most boring superstar and top 10 player ever. Watching Tim Duncan play basketball is very often like watching someone fish. Waiting, boredom, and some more waiting. But in the end, Duncan is usually the man with the fish in his hand. Since the retirement of Michael Jordan, no one has had a more successful career than Tim Duncan. Duncan is the only player in NBA history to be selected on the All-NBA and All-Defense teams during each of his first 13 seasons, six more than anyone else in league history. Rare are the players whose continued excellence is so enduring and so common that it goes unnoticed over time even though we are all aware that it is there. Duncan has quietly dominated the league for years, with no controversy, 
no insane dunks, no constant media appearances. Even his big games look kind of modest. There was no complete takeover with incredible shooting like Curry or Clay. Nor was there what the fans often value most, sometimes a forced takeover of the game in the last few minutes like Kobe Bryant, Larry Bird, and Michael Jordan. No. Timmy played the same way in almost all situations. Make the right move, pass to an open teammate, make a jump hook, make a bank shot, close out the rebound, be smarter than your opponent. Nothing in his game was exciting. Duncan had just 835 dunks during his career, which accounts for one dunk every other game. I only remember two of his baskets in his entire career. A falling shot over Shaq in 2004 that was annulled by Fisher, and a game-tying three against Phoenix in 2008. Everything else was a blur of bank shots, hooks, and tip-ins. The man scored 26,000 points in his career. Methodical, constant, at times even sterile and unattractive. But most importantly, he got the job done. When someone loses 20 pounds at the age of 36, and when he changes the way he runs to reduce knee pressure, and then leads his team to two more NBA Finals, now that's greatness, and shows tremendous passion for the sport. Duncan gave multiple discounts to the Spurs so they could spend on other players. On and off the floor, he almost always did the right thing. Everything was simple and maximally efficient. When Duncan retired, quietly, and without a farewell tour, the greatest power forward the NBA has ever seen was gone, and there will never be another one like him.